This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Need to Hone, and we're continuing today with our Core Set 2020 Limited Set Review. Today we're looking at green. We've already looked at the four other colors. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the rest of the cards in the set. I also still have to come in archetype guide and my picks for the best commons and uncommons in the set. Keep in mind that I use a letter grade system to evaluate these cards, and if you don't know what those grades mean, they are explained in the description of this video. All right, now let's get started with our first green card, which is Barkhide Troll. This is two green mana for a 2-2 troll at Uncommon. It enters the battlefield with a plus and plus one counter on it, and you can pay one generic to remove a plus and plus one counter from Barkhide Troll, and it gains Hexproof until end of turn. While this is a bit hard to consistently cast on turn two and limited, I think it's still pretty great. A two mana 3-3 three, three that is difficult to remove thanks to that activated ability is some serious business. There are also a few other plus and plus one counter synergies around that make him even better. Despite that cost, I think he is first pickable, though keep in mind you probably want around 10 forests to really be happy with him. I'm giving him a B-. Next up we have Brightwood Tracker, which for 3 generic and a green is a 2-4 elf scout at common. It has an activated ability where you can pay 5 generic and a green and tap it to look at the top 4 cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, a 4 mana 2-4 isn't the best stat line, but it's a kind of okay defensive stat line to have, if that's what you're looking for. This has a nice mana sync ability, the kind that helps you really grind out a win when you and your opponent are in top deck mode, and the game is really going down to who can draw the most spells, something that doesn't happen every game, but does happen often enough. You're usually going to hit a card with this ability. Most decks have plenty of creatures and 4 cards is a lot. You'll miss sometimes and that'll suck, but you'll hit with it pretty regularly. I think most green decks feel alright about having one of these around as a late game mana sink and a kind of serviceable creature if the game doesn't reach that point. I think it's a C. Next we have Cavalier of Thorns, which for 2 generic and 3 green is a 5-6 elemental knight at mythic rare. It's got reach. When it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top 5 cards of your library. You put a land card from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. When it dies, you may exile it, and if you do, put another target card from your graveyard on top of your library. I think at the beginning of the week I said that white had the worst of this cycle, but now that we're looking at the last of these, I think green got the worst card in the Cavalier cycle, but it is still pretty darn good. It obviously has stats that do very well on the vanilla test, but it has an into the battlefield trigger that is not overly exciting in this format. Loading your graveyard has some minor synergy, but not really enough, but you also aren't going to be desperate for lands or anything if you're casting this guy for 5 mana already. Sure, maybe he helps you splash a little bit, but he's not going to be great at it. I kind of wish he just searched your library for a land and put it into play tapped. I think that would be perfectly reasonable and maybe put it more on par with the other Cavaliers, but that's not what he does. His death trigger is also not amazing. Putting a card on top of your library is decent, but it is considerably less powerful than getting the card directly to your hand, and I think people forget that sometimes. But it's still a Cavalier, it's still got great stats, it still does stuff on top of having great stats, and it's still a card you usually first pick. It's just not a bomb like three of the Cavaliers are. Instead, it's just a B. Next up, we have Centaur Courser, who for two generic and a green is a 3-3 Centaur Warrior at common. Vanilla 3-mana three 3-3s three are usually pretty decent limited. That just isn't a stat line that you see with regularity. And even though this creature is absolutely nothing apart from those stats, that's plenty. This is a solid C, the kind of card you'll play one or two of and feel pretty good to curve out with. Next up we have Elvish Reclaimer, which for one green mana is a 1-2 Elf Warrior at rare. It gets plus 2 plus 2 as long as there are 3 or more land cards in your graveyard. You can pay 2 generic and tap it and sacrifice a land to search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. So, a 1 mana 1-2 isn't all that great and limited since it gets outpaced as early as turn 2, but this one does help you fix mana, and in the late game it gets to be a 3-4, which, you know, by the late game isn't all that impressive. Mostly, I think you run this as a source of fixing. And keep in mind, it does search for any land, including non-basics. That does matter in this format where there are non-basics at common that produce two colors. I think this is just a solid playable, but not even really the best way to fix your mana. But, you know, it'll do. It's a C. Next up we have Feral Invocation, which for two generic and a green is a common aura with flash. An enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two. As we've talked about throughout the week already and in basically all of my limited reviews, auras have problems in limited, namely the risk of getting you two for one, which is very real. 
We have seen some auras this week who managed to rise above that by replacing themselves. We'll still see one in this video that does that actually, or by being really efficient. Is this aura one of those? Not exactly. I do think flash, putting flash on an aura obviously makes it better than it would be otherwise. And that's because you can use it as a pseudo removal spell. And if you can do that, you won't really be getting two for one in the end if your opponent kills your guy because you killed one of theirs already, meaning you and your opponent are both down two cards. Now, you still can't play this in a lot of situations where your opponent might have a way to interact at instant speed, but I think situations will present themselves enough when you have Feral Invocation that it isn't completely horrendous. All of that might sound like I really like this card, and I guess I do as far as auras go, but I still think you cut it more often than not, and usually you probably don't want to play it. I'm giving it a D+. Next, we have Ferocious Pup, which for two generic and a green is a 0-1 wolf at common. And when it enters the battlefield, you create a 2-2 green wolf creature token. Three mana for a 0-1 and a 2-2 is a decent deal. Green is interested in going wide, and this helps with that. This is solid filler for green decks, a C. Next up, we have Gargos, Vicious Watcher, who for three generic and three green is an 8-7 legendary Hydra at rare. It's got Vigilance. Hydra spells you cast cost four less to cast, and... Whenever a creature you control becomes a target of a spell, Gargos Vicious Watcher fights up to one target creature you don't control. So here's the final card in this cycle of legendary rares with each color's iconic creature type, and that costs triple colored mana, and I think it's the best of the group. A 6 mana 8-7 with Vigilance is amazing, even at triple green, but what pushes this into being a bomb is the fact that your opponent is going to be miserable trying to find a way to kill this monster. That's because any removal spell they use will result in Gargos almost assuredly taking down one of your opponent's creatures before he gets hit with the removal spell. That's already great if that's all he did, but if you target Gargos, it still fights stuff, which is incredible. The whole Hydra Clause probably won't come up in this format, but there is one other rare Hydra that we'll get to, and if it ever does, it's going to be bonkers. This might be triple green, but I think triple green is the easiest of the mana costs on this cycle, since green has more access to ramp and fixing than anyone else. This is a bomb. I'm giving it an A. Next up, we have Gift of Paradise, which for two generic and a green is a common aura. It's got Enchant Land. When it enters the battlefield, you gain three life, and Enchanted Land has tap, add two mana of any one color. This is a decent source of fixing and ramp. I think I would usually have a plus one plus one counter on this type of card more than life gain, but sometimes you're going to have to take another hit to the face if you're spending turn three on this, and that helps you get around the downside. This is nice because it helps you splash even double colored cards, especially if you can get two or three of them, and that's not always easy to do. I think most of the time, if you're in green, you probably want to be splashing a powerful off color card or two because cards like this enable that. If a splash doesn't really come together, this probably isn't worth playing, unless you're really interested in ramping. I think it's a solid C. Next up, we have Greenwood Sentinel, which for one generic and a green is a 2-2 Elf Scout at common, and it's got Vigilance. Another reprint from the recent past, Greenwood Sentinel is pretty underwhelming these days. A 2-mana 2-2 two two is a D+, and adding Vigilance to one does make it better, but not by a lot. Vigilance just isn't that impactful of a keyword on a small creature. It matters, but it only gets its grade up to a C-. You'll play it when you need two drops, but you kind of hope you're going to pick up some better two drops. Next up, we have Growth Cycle, which for one generic and a green is a common instant. It says target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. It gets an additional plus two, plus two until end of turn for each card named Growth Cycle in your graveyard. Well, this is an interesting trick, and the final card in the Collect Em All cycle at common we've been looking at Two mana for plus three plus three is already kind of a decent trick, but the fact that it pumps your creature even more if you have growth cycle in your graveyard seems kind of cool. The awkward thing here is that most of the time you don't want to be running too many tricks. I know I'm going to find myself losing to an opponent who casts one of these with three others in their graveyard to just do an additional nine damage to me out of nowhere, but I mostly think this is just a decent trick, and it seems a little dangerous to try to go all in on it because of the extra effect as tricks are inherently risky and situational, so I'm giving it a C-. Next up, we have Healer of the Glade, which for one green mana is a 1-2 elemental at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you gain three life. This kind of card mostly feels like a sideboard card to me, unless maybe you're in black and or white as well and have a life gain payoff or two, but even then, this isn't great. One mana for a 1-2 that gains you three life just isn't worth a whole card against most opponents. It just isn't impactful. This is probably a D in your main board, so... Who is it good to side in against? Well, 
Really aggressive decks, especially those with lots of X1s. If you can manage to trade with this as well as gain the 3 life, you're really slowing them down. Don't get me wrong, it isn't incredible even then out of the sideboard, but that's where I can see me using this. I think it's a C- as a sideboard card. It does have the elemental creature type, which matters some in this set, but I still don't see it being much better than this. Next up, we have Howling Giant, who for 5 generic and 2 green is a 5-5 giant druid and uncommon. He's got reach, and when he enters the battlefield, you make 2 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens. This is my kind of 7-drop. Not all decks want 7-drops, but when they do, they should be playing one that makes 3 bodies, like this guy. 7 mana for 9-9 nine, nine worth of stats, 5-5 five, five of which has reach, is a great deal, and he gets some extra value because there are ways in this format to abuse his into the battlefield ability, and because green is a color interested in going wide. I think most green decks will probably have room for a 7-drop, and it is hard to do much better than this guy, at least at the lower rarities. He stabilizes the board if you're behind, gets you ahead if you're at parity, and seals the deal if you're ahead. Now, he does cost a lot of mana, and that's tough to overcome, but I think I'm going to highly value the first copy of this guy, just because he does so much work, and I'm going to be taking him relatively highly, even with a first pick in some packs. I'm giving him a B-. Sometimes you'll want a second copy of this guy too, but I wouldn't value it quite as much as the first. Next up, we have Leafkin Druid, which for one generic and a green is a 0-3 elemental druid at common. You can tap it to add green mana, and if you control four more creatures, you get to add two green mana instead. Mana dorks are always pretty nice and limited. 0-3 is a nice body to have on one since it blocks reasonably well if you need it to. Most of the time, this will just be adding green mana in the early going, and maybe in the later part of the game you can get the extra mana. It also doesn't hurt that it happens to have the elemental creature type, which is well supported in this set. I have a hard time not giving reasonably efficient mana dorks grades below B-, and I think that's what this gets. Being able to play your 4-drop on turn 3 is just so great and limited. This is a first pick in some weaker packs. Next up, we have Leyline of Abundance, which for 2 generic and 2 green is a rare enchantment with the Leyline Clause. That is, you get to put it onto the battlefield if it's in your opening hand. And also says whenever you tap a creature for mana, add an additional green. And you can pay 6 generic and 2 green to put a plus and plus 1 counter on each creature you control. This is another F. There just aren't enough mana dorks in this format. We did just see one, of course, but there aren't enough of them for this to be worth it. And that ability is incredibly expensive, especially if you had to pay four mana for this thing at some point, too. So, yeah, it's just an F. Next up, we've got Loaming Shaman, which for two generic and a green is a 3-2 Centaur Shaman at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, target player shuffles any number of target cards from their graveyard into their library. This is a reprint and a card I think people will underrate a little bit. I want to start by saying I certainly don't think this card's incredible, but I do think it has an Enter the Battlefield trigger that matters often enough that it's certainly solid, especially because it has okay stats. While this format doesn't have a ton of graveyard nonsense going on, the best thing to do with this is shuffle non-lands into your deck to increase the density of non-lands in your deck. This gets better if your deck has bombs or it is particularly good at drawing cards. Sometimes the effect will impact your opponent too. Now, as I said at the beginning, this isn't that good, but I think it does enough to get more than the grade I would give a vanilla 3-mana three 3-2, three which is probably a D. Instead, I think Loaming Shaman's a C-. minus. Next up, we have Mammoth Spider, which for 4 generic and a green is a 3-5 reach. It's a spider. It's common. This set has more guys at reach at lower rarities than usual, and I think Mammoth Spider might just be the worst of the three, meaning it is a little less of a necessity than it sometimes is. Green just can't stop flyers well, especially if paired with black or red, and you just have to have a big boy with reach sometimes, and this does the job. I don't think you always play it, though. I can see it being one of the first cards out, especially if I picked up a Howling Giant or another spider that we're going to see in a moment. I think this one's a C-. Next up, we have Might of the Masses, which for one green mana is an uncommon instant, and it says target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each creature you control. This is an alright trick. With just the creature it is targeting, it at least gives plus and plus one, and occasionally you can use it to sneak in lethal if you have a huge board and your opponent lets damage through. I think getting plus two plus two out of it will be easy enough that it is a perfectly reasonable trick with a reasonable floor and a high ceiling. The fact it is only one green is great too, because you get blown out less if your opponent does have removal in response, and you have more of a chance of being able to play another creature or something in your second main phase. I think this is a C. Next up, we have Natural End, which for two generic and a green is a common instant, and it says destroy target artifact or enchantment, you gain three life. This is obviously a sideboard card in an ideal situation, but I do think there might be enough artifacts and enchantments around 
in this set that mainboarding this might not be quite as bad as usual. I feel like most people will have two to three targets for this, which is almost enough for it to be in the main deck, but probably still a D plus there. More targets than that though, and it starts to get interesting. It's a C plus out of your sideboard. Next, we have Netcaster Spider, which for two generic and a green is a 2-3 spider at common. It's got reach, and when it blocks a creature with flying, it gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. Here's the other reach spider I was talking about. While it can't block quite as well as Mammoth Spider, it can actually take down even bigger flyers since it becomes a 4-3 when it blocks them, and that's enough to take down the vast majority of flyers in this set. What's more is Netcaster Spider has more aggressive stats and is a more capable attacker if that's what you need him to do. I think he gets a C. Next up, we have Night Pack Ambusher, which for two generic and two green is a 4-4 wolf at rare with flash. Other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one, plus one. And at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast a spell this turn, create a 2-2 green wolf creature token. So a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four flash is already a B- in my book. It's efficient and can be brought in after your opponent's attacks to just eat one of their creatures, which means you're going to get a 2-for-1 out of it. Night Pack Ambusher has a lot more going on than that, though. While wolves and werewolves aren't a huge theme in this set, in fact, there are no werewolves at all, there are a few wolves at lower rarities, so his lord ability will actually come up and pump a couple of your guys every now and then, and doing that at instant speed could give you even more of a blowout. What really pushes the ambusher over for me, though, is that anytime you don't cast a spell on your turn, it makes sure that you add to your board anyway. Flooding out? That's okay. Have a wolf token. Want to leave up some instant speed stuff? Cool. Have a wolf token. Turns where you can't or don't do anything come up enough and limited that expecting this to make a wolf or two each game isn't far-fetched. And keep in mind, those wolves will also be 3-3s three because he pumps them. So between being a good card with just those stats and flash, to being a wolf lord and churning out wolf tokens, I think this is a straight-up bomb and there isn't much in this set you should ever take over it, giving it an A. Next up we have Overcome, which for 3 generic and 2 green is an uncommon sorcery, and it says creatures you control get plus 2 plus 2 and gain trample until end of turn. This isn't quite Overrun, which gives plus 3 plus 3 instead, but it is a reasonable facsimile. I think that if your deck has at least 15 creatures in it and it's green, you probably want to play one of these because it can have such a devastating impact on the board. Sometimes people refer to an effect like this as a bomb, but for me a bomb is something that can always help you, and this isn't so good unless you have the board to help it out. That said, if you get to the point where casting it is worthwhile, in most cases you're just going to win, the problem can be getting there. Still, I think having one of these in green is always going to be a good plan, but you probably don't want more than one. I'm giving it a C+, the first copy should be pursued accordingly. Next up, we have Overgrowth Elemental, which for two generic and a green is a 3-2 elemental at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you put a plus and plus one counter on another target elemental you control. And whenever another creature you control dies, you gain one life. If that creature was an elemental, put a plus and plus one counter on Overgrowth Elemental. This looks like a strong elemental payoff to me. If you can consistently put a plus and plus one counter on another elemental, you'll be pretty happy. But a nice thing here is that even if you can't do that, if you have elementals die later, you still get some value out of them. I think this seems like a strong enough payoff to push me into green in the early going of a draft and wanting to really pursue elementals. I'm giving it a B-. Next up we have Plummet, which for one generic and a green is a common instant. It says destroy target creature with flying. This is classic sideboard material. Plummet is possible as a 23rd card if you're desperate, as most people have a few targets for it at least. So I think it's a D in your main deck and a solid C out of your sideboard. Some opponents will have lots of flyers. Next up we have Pulse of Marasa, which for two generic and a green is an uncommon instant, and it says return target creature or land card from a graveyard to its owner's hand. You gain six life. This is a reprint and one that surprised a lot of people last time we saw it, including me. It is easy to overlook a card like this. We see effects that let us return cards to our hand on a regular basis, and most of them aren't all that good unless it's attached to a creature. However, one thing this has that most versions of that effect don't have is that it's an instant and it gains you life. Those two things make it significantly stronger. The six life you gain can essentially reverse any tempo you lose by not actually playing a card the turn you play this, and being instant speed means you can keep your options open until the end of your opponent's turn and maybe get back your great creature they just killed or whatever. Now, I don't think all of that means that this is something first pickable. Like always, this type of card can be dead for a significant portion of the game, especially because this only lets you return lands or creatures, so running more than one of these can sometimes be a liability. However, I think every green deck out there probably wants the first copy of this. I'm giving it a C+. 
Next up, we have Rabid Bite, which for one generic and a green is a common sorcery. It says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. We've seen this and cards like it a lot lately, and they're all pretty nice. While it has some downsides, namely that unlike most good removal spells, it does open you up to potentially getting destroyed by a two-for-one, since if your creature dies in response to this, Rabid Bite just fizzles. Still, it is highly efficient, and green doesn't exactly have problems having creatures in play who are large enough to take advantage of this. You really need things with three or more power for it to work out, but that will usually just happen naturally. I think in a weak pack you can first pick this. It is premium removal despite those downsides. I'm giving it a B-. Next up we have Season of Growth, which for one generic and a green is an uncommon enchantment, and it says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one, and whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you control, draw a card. This looks to me like the most exciting and fun build around in the format. I honestly think a two-mana enchantment that lets you scry every time a creature enters the battlefield is already kind of playable. Most decks have 15 or more creatures, and scrying is a great way to find more creatures and continue to improve your draws. So I think it's maybe a D in a deck that can't really take advantage of the second clause. This card then asks you to be casting spells on your own creatures, something that can be dangerous with combat tricks and the like things I've said a lot already in this video, but this really incentivizes you doing so and helps you avoid two-for-ones since you do get to draw the card even if the creature you target dies. Also works well with Rabid Bite, which we just looked at. So yeah, I think it's a D in your typical deck, maybe a C-plus as a build-around, and I kind of hope it goes even higher and that it's a lot of fun to play with. Next up, we have Sedge Scorpion, which for one green mana is a common scorpion. It's a 1-1 one, one, and it's got Death Touch. I am always down for one mana, one, one Death Touchers. They may not be the most relevant of attackers, but they are among the most relevant blockers around, causing your opponent's big boys to suddenly stop attacking. Being able to trade for anything with it makes it easy for you to trade up and come out ahead. It also works well with Rabid Bite, despite not having that three power I like to have with it because of Death Touch. This is a solid playable for green decks and definitely a C. Next up, we have Shared Summons, which for three generic and two green is a rare instant. It says, search your library for up to two creature cards with different names, reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle your library. I kind of like this. Uh, five mana to draw two cards is not that good, but five mana to draw the two best creatures in your library is a lot better, especially at instant speed. While this does compare some to Ignite the Beacon from More of the Spark, paying five to get two creatures is going to be better than getting two Planeswalkers most of the time, not because creatures are necessarily better, but because it is far easier to construct a deck with enough creatures to make playing this worth it. It also moves up considerably if you have some bombs in your deck. It still costs 5 and is a pretty big tempo hit to pay 5 and not affect the board at all, and sometimes you just won't have the time to do something like that. But I think you probably feel fine about having one of these in all your green decks. Obviously it is rare, so that won't be happening a ton, but still. I wouldn't take this with a super early pick, but it is a nice playable. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, we have Shifting Ceratops, who for two generic and two green is a 5-4 dinosaur at rare. Can't be countered, it has protection from blue, which means it can't be blocked, targeted, dealt damage, enchanted, or equipped by anything blue. And it has a sweet activated ability where you can pay one green mana, and it gains your choice of reach, trample, or haste until end of turn. This seems very good. Four mana for a vanilla 5-4 is probably at least a C plus these days, but when we add all the rest of the text, it is obviously considerably better than that. Protection from blue means a decent chunk of opponents will struggle to interact or block this, and the ability to gain a slew of keyword abilities for a small mana investment is nice. This dinosaur has a nice mix of abilities too. Haste can help you close out the game out of nowhere when you cast it, Trample can help you in situations where your opponent might normally be able to chum block, and Reach is good if you're trying to stabilize and you have to use your Ceratops defensively against Flyers. It plays a variety of roles and that flexibility is nice. This is a good card, one that is almost always going to be your first pick when you see it. I don't quite think it completely reshapes a board, and for me that means it falls a little bit short of A range, but it's close. I'm giving it a B plus. Next up we have Silverback Shaman, which for three generic and two green is a 5-4 Ape Shaman at common. It's got Trample. When it dies, you draw a card. This is a really strong common. He does well in the vanilla test, has evasion, and replaces himself when he dies. That means he is a two for one that is really threatening, and that's great. One thing I could see happening with him is that your five drop slot is just too loaded. I mean, you only want so many in most formats, but I have a hard time saying no to a two for one like this guy. I think the first copy of him is basically always a B minus, and that maybe subsequent copies drop a little bit, but I'm gonna give him that B minus. 
Next up, we have Thicket Crasher, which for three generic and a green is a 4-3 elemental rhino at common. It's got trample, and other elementals you control have trample. I think a 4-mana four 4-3 four with trample is probably a C or maybe even a C plus these days. You know, evasion is real, and while trample isn't the best of evasive abilities, it does make it really hard for your opponent to chump block, and that's always great. And these stats are nice, too. Giving trample to other elementals is nice as well. Green, blue, and red all have a bunch of elementals in them, and giving them trample is going to impact the board. Sometimes the crasher will be able to come down, and that very turn, you'll have a creature who can now attack more effectively. I think all of that makes this a pretty good common for green decks, one you even consider first picking. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, we have Thrashing Brontodon, which for one generic and two green is a 3-4 dinosaur at uncommon. You can pay one generic mana to sacrifice it and destroy an artifact or enchantment. We saw Thrashing Brontodon pretty recently. Um, a 3-mana three 3-4 three, is obviously really great already, probably good enough stats to be a C+. Adding the additional value here of being able to blow up artifacts or enchantments is nice. It's also kind of nice sometimes to have a main board way to do that that isn't sort of taking up a slot in your deck you don't want to give to a naturalize effect, because here you still have a creature who's got not just reasonable stats but good ones, in addition to having utility against opponents who might have problem permanence of these types, and you don't have to be running a card that should probably be in your sideboard. And all of that makes it so this is also a pretty first pickable card uh, for green. I think it's a B minus. Next up, we have Veil of Summer, which for one green mana is an uncommon instant. It says, draw a card if an opponent has cast a blue or black spell this turn. Spells you control can't be countered this turn. You and permanents you control gain hexproof from blue and from black until end of turn. Like all the cards in this cycle, this is a nice sideboard card. Sometimes you might have to cast this against an opponent just to draw a card, but doing that for one mana isn't too terrible. The ceiling of this card is fairly high. If you cast this in response to your opponent using a blue or black removal spell, you're getting yourself a two for one for only a single green mana, which is a nice deal. Like the other cards in this cycle, I think it's dangerous to mainboard this. I think it's an F if you do. I mean, you might run into people who happen to be playing these colors, and you have a decent chance to do so, but it's probably still best to begin it in your sideboard. The other thing I like about this one a little less than the others we've looked at is that it's reactive. Your opponent has to be doing something specific for it to be good. The other ones are like removal spells and bounce spells and things that are just always going to have something to do. Veil of Summer won't always be useful, and so I don't think it quite has the same high ceiling out of your sideboard that the rest of this cycle does, but I think it's a good sideboard card. I think it's a C-plus out of your sideboard. Next up, we have Vivian Arcbow Ranger, who for one generic and three green is a legendary planeswalker Vivian at Mythic Rare. She starts with four loyalty. She has a plus one ability that lets you put two plus and plus one counters among up to two target creatures. They gain trample until end of turn. She has a minus three that has a creature you control deal damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker. And she has a minus five that says you may choose a creature card you own from outside the game, reveal it, and put it into your hand. So Vivian's really strong. While her ultimate is kind of underwhelming in most scenarios, keep in mind that her ability only means you can grab a card from your sideboard, not literally any card in Sanction play. So yeah, that ability isn't all that great. Her other two abilities, though, are very strong. Permanently making creatures larger and granting them an evasive ability is nice. And being able to kill stuff with that minus three is good, too. Remember, it's not a fight effect. It's a punch effect where your creature just gets to do the damage on its own. I think a lot of games she will come down, help your creature kill something and clear the board for herself, while she can plus one for a while until using her removal effect is necessary again. She does cost triple green, and the chances of actually being able to play her on turn four are kind of low because of that. But triple green is easier than all the other triple costs because of fixing and mana dorks and the like. She is a planeswalker who needs creatures to shine, and I do think that keeps her out of being a straight-up bomb. She can't just sort of protect herself all on her own. She needs friends around to help her with it. Still, she's pretty close to a bomb. She is one of the stronger cards in the set. Even if she doesn't quite reach into the A range, she is a B+. Next up, we have Voracious Hydra, which for X generic mana and 2 green is a 0-1 Hydra rare. It's got Trample, and it enters the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And when it enters the battlefield, you have two options. One of these is that you double the number of plus and plus one counters on the Hydra, and the other is that your Hydra fights target creature you don't control. So here's that other Hydra that would be hilarious to get along with Gargos, especially because it's also a very good card. Both options you have to choose from are going to be very mana efficient, and you'll choose the one that makes the most sense given a situation. For example, let's say you pay three for X. That means you either get a three four with Trample that fights and kills, a creature your opponent controls who is an X3 or smaller and hopefully survives, or you get a 6-7 with Trample. 
That scenario is just a sort of run-of-the-mill one too. Sometimes it will be far better than that. You can obviously cast it for less mana and still have it be pretty decent. Imagine casting it for four mana, in which case you get a 4-5 with trample for four or a 2-3 with trample that kills a small creature. That's also a pretty good option. And obviously, as you spend more mana on it, the two options become more and more impressive. Most of the time, I do think you choose the fight effect because you need removal. But when what you really need is an evasive win condition, well, Voracious Hydra does the job and it's always going to be very efficient because it's just going to be huge. So I think this is a bomb. I'm giving it an A-. minus. So... Next up, we have Vorst Claw, who's four generic and two green for a 7-7 elemental horror at common. A vanilla six mana 7-7 seven, seven at common is a nice thing for green, and there was a time where these sorts of stats would be absolutely incredible. But these days, we really need things that do something other than just be generic stats most of the time. I'm not saying this is bad, just that I think some people will just sort of see this on the vanilla test and think of it as being good because of that. And I don't think it really gets into good range. I think it's really just filler. It's a six drop you can have at top of your curve. It has the elemental type. The fact, I would honestly just rather have a Colossal Dreadmaw, a six mana six six with Trample, rather than a six mana seven seven like we have here. But, you know, all that said, playing one of these in your green decks will probably happen often enough. And I think that's a C. Next up, we have Wake Root Elemental, which for four generic and two green is a 5-5 elemental at rare. And you can pay five green mana to untap a land you control. It becomes a 5-5 elemental creature with haste. It's still a land, and it's going to be a land forever if you do this. So this is an interesting design. A six mana 5-5 five five doesn't do a good job on the vanilla test. It's probably a D or a D plus. This does have a powerful activated ability, but the fact that it costs five green to make this work is incredibly difficult. Green has lots of cards that produce mana of any color and mana dorks that help you produce green, but I think it's more likely that this is just way too difficult to use in most decks, even if it is a powerful effect. I think I'm gonna give it a C minus with the caveat that if you're a mono green deck, it's probably a B. But making them on a green deck and limited is not going to be an easy thing to do. Next up, we have Wolfkin Bond, which is four generic and green for an enchantment aura at common. It has enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, you create a 2-2 green wolf creature token, and the enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two. This is another card at a lower rarity that makes a wolf for your night pack ambusher. This one is a reprint, and last time we saw it, it was pretty solid. I have a hard time getting behind auras, as we've already said, that don't do something to add to the board other than be put on a creature, but Wolfkin Bond does that. Paying 5 for plus 2 plus 2 wouldn't be very good, but adding a 2-2 to the board does make it a lot better. It likely lets you attack with something that couldn't before, or at the very least lets you attack harder, and it makes sure that a wolf is around to block and maybe even start attacking the next turn. This helps you... Avoid it being a straight up two for one if your opponent manages to kill your creature since it does leave a wolf behind. You can still get two for one if you play this while your opponent has mana up and they have some way to interact. You're not going to get the wolf if that happens. But if it's allowed to resolve, you're going to have a wolf no matter what and at least you walk away with something. This is a solid playable for green decks and I think a C. Next up we have Wolf Rider's Saddle which for three generic and a green is an uncommon artifact equipment. When it enters the battlefield, it creates a 2-2 green wolf creature token, and then you attach Wolf Rider's Saddle to it. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one and can't be blocked by more than one creature, and it has an equip cost of three. So this whole cycle of equipment, I guess it's sort of a mini cycle. It's only in red, white, and green. But the whole cycle is giving us equipment that's better than it usually is on average. The problem with equipment is often that they have no immediate impact on the board if you can't afford to equip them right away. But this gets around that by making a wolf token that it attaches to. Basically, this gives you a 4-mana 3-3 that can't be blocked by more than one creature. One that leaves behind an equipment that you can then move elsewhere. Obviously, it's a little more flexible than that because you can move the saddle whenever you want to. That equip cost is a bit steep, but the fact that you already get a body out of it does help mitigate against that. What's more is there are a few ways to blink or flicker this, and that gives you another wolf token, which would be pretty funny. Now, don't get me wrong. The card is nothing special. I think the equip cost of three really weighs it down. I think if it was two, maybe it would be a little better, but I think it does weigh it down. I think it's the worst in this cycle of equipment that we've looked at this week, but it's still more playable than most equipment in most limited formats, though I do think you cut it a significant portion of the time. I think it comes in as a C-. And next, we have our last card, which is Woodland Champion, which for one generic and a green is a 2-2 elf scouted uncommon. And whenever one or more tokens into the battlefield under your control, you put that many plus and plus one counters on Woodland Champion. 
This is a build-around, but it's the kind that has a very reasonable floor, and that's really the best kind of build-around. Your average green deck in this format, as we've seen, will probably have ways to make creature tokens, maybe two to four ways to do so, meaning that this is better than just a two-mana 2-2, two -two, even in a deck that isn't loaded up with tokens, and I think that means it's probably a C in your typical green deck, and a solid B in a deck that can effectively build around it with a bunch of tokens. That means in some packs, it might be worth gambling on early, since it has a high floor and a high ceiling. Well, those are all the green cards in Core Set 2020. Tomorrow we wrap up the set review by talking about the multicolored, colorless, and land cards in Core Set 2020. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of this set review, as well as more and more videos about Core Set 2020 coming out very soon, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.